Uh, Well, open up your Bibles to the book of Psalms. Uh, We're going to read from Psalm 2. Uh, It is the book of Psalms because there's multiple ones, but when we read one, it's not Psalms 2, right? It's Psalm 2. Uh, And follow along with me. I'm going to read the entire Psalm this morning. Uh, If you don't have Bibles, there's Bibles in the back. You you can feel free to get up and grab one. It won't interrupt me and it won't bother me at all if you're getting up and moving to get that. Uh, Nothing better than to put your own eyes on the Word of God and see what it declares. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 12. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, on my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Church, what amazing comfort, hope, joy, confidence that we as God's elect saved from sin through Christ's finished work may have in our God who is sovereign over all. This psalm of David is a prophecy that has been fulfilled and is uniquely displayed to us in the New Testament writings. I want to start with this reality for a few reasons that I will unpack as we continue on in our time together. First, though this passage brings great hope for us today, we always want to consider it in light of its first and original purpose before applying it to ourselves, or else we really run the risk of misapplying or misinterpreting Scripture. You see, far too often, we are simply too self-involved, too self-focused. We become so caught up in our own time and in, in the happenings of the world around us, the things that are going on, and we are often vulnerable to read a prophecy of Scripture and declare that it must be about us. It must be talking about our time. I want to encourage you, church, to be careful with such things. Ecclesiastes is clear to say that there is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1, 9 through 10. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. You see, church, the king's raging against God, the peoples plotting in vain to think they can rule in their own ways and cast off the bonds given by a sovereign God, it's not a new concept. It's not a new thing. And unfortunately, when we read Scripture with this self-focused type of view, we can miss many of the beautiful realities of fulfilled prophecy and the opportunity of increased confidence in God's word that we can have because of the fulfillment of his prophecies. So what I'd like to do this morning is to walk through our passage um, in Psalm and consider the ways that the prophecy has been fulfilled, and then consider the ways that these truths still apply to us today. I want you to consider the hope, the confidence that you and I and all who are in Christ may have and enjoy, even in times of turmoil and strife. 
So as we walk through these passages, I, I want to point out both how these things have come to pass before our time and, and how they can still be applied to us today. So turn with me first to the book of Acts. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 4. And we're going to read a, a longer section just so that you can get the context of uh, this historical account. And I want to show you how clearly the apostles declared that this prophecy had taken place. So Acts chapter 4. We're going to read verses 5 through 31. Acts 4, 5 through 31. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priest family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, They had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a noble sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than forty years old." When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, By the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and their rulers were gathered together against the Lord And against his anointed. For truly in this city there were together, sorry, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So church, do you see how clearly this passage from Psalm 2 has come to pass in history? The apostles even quoted from the passage and said, this has happened. They ascribe this very passage to the death of Christ in the hands of the Jews and and the Roman leaders of the time. But don't miss this very important point. Their sinful actions were used by God for his sovereign purposes. Acts 4, 28. To do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Church, God is sovereign, 
and everything that comes to pass comes through the hand of God. He has not left us as he did not leave the apostles. God is not thrown off by the rebellion of a sin-filled fallen world that so longs to be their own God, to break these bonds, right? God is in control, and he is working all things out for his glory and for the good of those who love him, as he declares in Romans 8, 28. Now we see so clearly that this psalm passage has come to pass here in in the life and the death and the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The apostles declared as much in Acts 4, and historically it is clear that the Jews and the Gentiles had raged and plotted against God when none other than the Messiah had walked and lived among them. All who were present at that time and all who have since died apart from faith in the Messiah, now know full well the wrath of the Son. And as the apostles declared to the council that they stood before in our Acts passage, they should have kissed the Son, lest he be angry with them, and they perish in the way. Church, please see that though this prophecy has come to pass already, The call to a lost and rebellious world is still the same today. Kiss the Son, O image bearers of God, lest He be angry with you and you perish in the way. Now that we've considered how this passage from Psalm 2 has been fulfilled, let's consider the ways in which it applies to us today and and how we may be uh, comforted by its fulfillment and yet warned and strengthened By how it still applies. Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. This morning I'm going to take for granted that you can see the nations raging against God, plotting in vain against him, and I won't spend much time explaining the ways in which they do that. Rather, I want us to consider first why they do it. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? When we consider the work of Adam and all of those who fall under him in their sin— It is not hard to see why the people plot in vain and the nations rage. You see, church, the biggest problem that our world has is not racism or suffering. It's not hate and violence. It is not false religion or wicked dictators. It is not disease or death. It's not evil governments or even rebellious Children, church, the greatest problem the world has is sin. The only answer to the problem of sin is the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord. To be clear, these problems that I listed, though they are but a few that we deal with daily, they're not exhaustive, they all, indeed, are a result of sin. Sin is at the root of of all that ails our world. When man first decided that he could choose right and wrong for himself, it was in a sense a vain attempt to cast off the bonds of God's righteous rules and decrees. And as we look back to Genesis 3, we're going to see most certainly that this was done in vain. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 19. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good 
and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, Cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children." Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Consider, church, the deceitfulness of sin as it enters through the words and the temptation brought upon by uh, our brought upon our first parents by the serpent. Serpent said, Surely you will not die. You will actually become wise. You will be like God. And in vain did Adam and Eve eat of this fruit. They believed the lie of the serpent and the deceitfulness of sin. And in an attempt to cast off the bonds of being under the rule and authority of God, so that they could be like God themselves, they brought forth a much worse ruler and became slaves to sin. This didn't just affect them. It also subjected the world to enslavement to sin. Adam and Eve did not become like God. That was a lie. Indeed, they did die, spiritually speaking, and they were cast out of God's presence. So that was another lie. They did not become wise. Rather, they became wise in their own eyes. And as Scripture declares, there is more hope for fools than for those who are wise in their own eyes. For those of us whom God has graciously saved, you know full well the joy of God's rule over your heart as you are now slaves to Christ. You also know the the depth of your enslavement to sin prior to your salvation. You know that even though you are no longer enslaved to sin, You are constantly, daily, if not minute by minute, at war against sin and the old self whom you were saved from. You see, Adam and Eve in their own mind thought that it would be better to be like God than to be dependent upon Him. This change in thinking was the display of mankind believing that it would be better to be autonomous than to trust God and be under his rule and reign. And as our world continues on and grows in number and rebellion, this only becomes all the more clear. Consider the outrage from a large portion of our country's population that in one state, one of 50, there will be less opportunity 
to murder your unborn child in the womb. What a treacherous lie that has been believed when image bearers of God believe that the murder of another image bearer is health care and a good thing. This is the inevitable reasoning of those who are dead in sin and who oppose God and his righteous rule. The argument from those who claim that abortion is good, that not having this right, though it is obviously never a God-given right, is a burden and a bond placed upon them. They argue that they cannot bear that burden, that, that they must have the right to murder. And so as they try to cast off such a bond, they go so far as to make outlandish claims, such as the, the claim that this step is equal to making women slaves like those of the handmaids tell. How absurd, church. One news interview that I saw had a guest on, and he even declared that those who passed the laws were equal to the Taliban. He said that they were the American Taliban, and they were the real threat to this country. Church, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? This happens because of sin. When we consider what we as believers are commanded to do about this, we have to think through some things. For example, the answer is not scream as loud as you can and yell back. Show the world how angry you are for sin. The answer instead is what we find in Psalm 2. God has put Jesus on the throne, and God will do all his holy will even in this fallen, rebellious world. We must cry out to those in rebellion from the love within us, the thankfulness for our own salvation, and we must plead to them to repent and to trust in Jesus Christ. We must plead for them to put their rebellious ways aside and turn to the only Savior who can change their hearts. We must tell them to kiss the Son, lest He be angry with them and they perish in their present state. Now, don't miss this either, church. We should do what we can to push back the darkness uh, and to push back against the great sin in our world. However, we must do this in a way that honors God. We must speak the truth in love. So as our Ecclesiastes passage declared, there is nothing new under the sun. In Adam all men died, and only in Christ will any find life. The nations rage and the peoples plot in vain because they do not want to know God or submit to him. Scripture declares that all mankind indeed do know him, though not in a saving way. The very God whom they know they deny in their suppression of the truth as too controlling. They want to cast off his bonds. You see, even though image bearers of God deny that God exists, they cannot escape living in his world and feeling the weight of the law of God that has been placed in their hearts. This church is why the peoples plot in vain. This is why the nations rage. You see, even though in sin mankind denies God, they hate that they cannot escape his rule and the laws that he has given. This is yet another proof that man knows God, but suppresses him in their unrighteousness. Even though they denied God, they continue to fight against the moral law they know to be true in their heart, and they rage against God, trying to convince the world that the sin they chase after is good and right and honorable. One simple example is the sexual revolution, the sinful world's attack on gender as God created mankind, male and female, he created them. In light of this, I I thought it would perhaps be helpful for you, Christian, 
to see that this current rebellion, that the things that are happening in our time and in our world, though they may have difficult ramifications upon us for those who are in Christ, that this attack is not personal uh, in the sense that you are not the primary aim of the peoples and the nations raging and plotting in vain. Perhaps better said, those who plot and those who rage are doing so against God. We see this in Psalm 2, 2 through 3. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. It is against God that the people plot. It is against his bonds as sovereign ruler that they seek to cast away the cords. Why might this be helpful? Well, uh, I fear that it is becoming all too common for us to take these new afflictions, these ragings that affect us, and see them as a very personal attack. The removal of religious freedoms in light of secular ideas and agendas will have effects on us personally, but we must see them as an attack upon the commands and the goodness of God first and foremost, rather than a personal attack upon us. Now, to be clear, because they are attacking our God, it is very personal in a sense, right? We get that. But when we keep in mind that these people are sinners in rebellion against God first and foremost, it should cause us to not only have a righteous anger, you can be angry towards sin and sinners righteously, but it should also stir within us a, a deep heartbrokenness toward other image bearers who are dead in their sin. Those in rebellion against God will suffer eternally if they remain in their rebellion. Let me say it this way. Christian, we must never forget what God has graciously saved us from. This does not mean that we cannot be angry. Rather, it means that when we are angry, we must not sin. When the world flexes its hatred for our good God, we will be angry. It is an offense. There is a righteous anger that you and I as believers can have. However, what I aim to encourage you in is this. You and I, Christian, apart from God's grace and intervention in our life, we were the very ones flexing our hatred toward God and his righteous commands. You see, when we remember that we were saved from this foolishness, it will center our hearts on gospel truths and it will help us to be righteously angry and yet not become sinful in our anger towards those who are still dead in their sin. So in light of that, I want to encourage you to wrestle well with this balance of righteous anger for sin and a humble heartbrokenness for those who are still dead in their sin. You and I were hopeless apart from the work of God. So are they. May this keep us pressing forward the gospel and calling out sin with a right heart that honors God who saved us from our sin. Psalm 2, 1 through 6. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Church, see that God is not shaken by the rebellion of sinners. He's not shaken when entire nations of sinners rage against him and plot in vain. What God establishes will come to pass. 
the vanity of man to think that they can cast off God from his throne causes God to laugh. Do you see how little of concern this raging of sinful man is to God? Even the wording of the psalmist to say God sits in the heavens is a way of acknowledging his superiority and his authority, how much higher he is than mankind who are rebelling against him. The psalm declares that God holds them in derision. Now, uh, full disclosure, I had to look up what that word means. I've not used the term or the word derision, and so I thought it might be helpful for you as well if I define the word. Derision is the use of ridicule, ridicule or scorn to show contempt. It is a state of being laughed at or ridiculed, a state of being derided, an object of ridicule or scorn. Now, Christian, I would encourage you and I not to laugh in scorn at those who rage against God. We do not sit on his throne, and we do not within ourselves or any part of us or our own uh, supposed goodness possess God's power or righteous perfection. However, Christian, consider this. How different is God's response to this plotting and raging in comparison to our response? Have you been weighed down with the burden of things as they've progressed in ways that we thought may never happen? Take heart, Christian. Be comforted. Your God laughs at this rebellion. Your God, the one true God, is not moved or shaken in any sense of the word. He is not fearful or in dread of what rebellious sinners are doing and have done all throughout history. Christian, since God is not shaken, we should also stand steadfast in him. God will not be moved or dethroned, Christian. May we ever keep this in mind. We must warn dead sinners of the wrath of God to come, and we must tell of the gospel truth to them so that perhaps God may grant dead sinners repentance and faith, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Look again at the verses with me, Psalm 2, 4 through 6. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. God will speak to the fallen world one day in his wrath and fury, and it will be terrifying to those who are not his. In a very real sense, he did this in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Remember, this prophecy has been fulfilled then, and it still bears applicable truths to us today. Consider the fear of the religious leaders when Christ's body was no longer in the grave. What trembling Pontius Pilate must have felt to know he sentenced an innocent man for fear of rebellion and loss of his own position to death, and then to hear that the man he executed rose from the grave. Can you imagine how he felt when he heard that Jesus was no longer in the tomb? How about the religious leaders and the elders of the people of the Jews when they had detained the apostles and were charging them not to speak of Jesus? They saw that those men had such boldness and wisdom, and yet they were uneducated. They saw that these men were with Jesus, and they feared the crowds of people because even they themselves could not deny that the apostles had done something miraculous through the power of Christ. What about the fear of the Roman guards who stood at the tomb to make sure that nobody messed with it? See that these realities did most certainly come to pass and know that Scripture also speaks of a future day of judgment when God judges finally all mankind Consider the weight of those who remain dead in their sin when they hear his words and tremble. But until that day, Christian, 
you and I ought to be striving to share the gospel, to be doing the work of the ministry, that we may be useful tools in the hand of our sovereign Lord. Pastor Josh, in his uh, encouragement to me and a few of the leaders lately, has said, we should not be surprised when a sinful world acts sinfully. It's what they do. It's what they must do. They are enslaved to sin. We must not be surprised as if these actions are suddenly showing us that sinners sin. God is on the throne, and he is not surprised. Now hear this too, please. Whether things improve or things decline, see what God declares in the psalm passage and made happen in the fulfillment of this prophecy when Jesus was resurrected. Psalm 2, verse 6, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Christ reigns at the right hand of the Father, church. God has set his king on the throne. No effort of man could keep him from his sovereign plan. See again the claim of the apostles from our passage in Acts, verse uh, 24 of chapter 4, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves against the rulers, uh, sorry, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people, peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. The Lord laughs at the futile raging of men, Because he has set his king up through the very actions that sinful men thought would break their bonds. The very wicked and evil acts of sinful men were used by God to fulfill his purpose. And Christian, it will be the same now as it was then. Take heart, believer. Christ reigns on the throne and God is sovereign. He laughs at the feeble attempts of man to overthrow his rule. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he reigns. Oh, we surely long for that day when we see this completely finalized and enter into glory with our Lord and Savior. But for now, take heart and see that Christ is King. Our psalm passage continues In verse 7 through 9, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. Church, the wrath of God towards sinners is not something to be considered lightly. Since there are likely not uh, many pottery workers in here this morning, let me unpack briefly the depth of this passage. When verse 9 declares that Jesus will dash the raging and rebellious people of the nations to pieces like a potter's vessel, God is not declaring that these people will be, you know, a little cracked, a little broken. The way in which these terms are said are meant to paint a picture of utter destruction. Have you ever in your life hit a clay jar with something made of steel? There's no repairing it. I I remember growing up, uh, accidentally breaking things that were of great value to my mom. Uh, My mom had two sons, so roughhousing and accidents were commonplace in our house. My mom uh, also collected antiques. She also inherited many wonderful uh, antique things, and, and so... It was normal in our family that something would get broken. And whenever it happened, my my mom would very carefully collect all the pieces she could find. Uh, and, And over the years, she became really, really good at gluing these things back together. There are things in my parents' house now that I don't remember breaking, and you couldn't tell by looking at it. 
They've been glued and fixed and repaired, and they look like they did, like they've always looked. The words in this psalm are meant to convey that this breaking with the rod would not permit a putting back together of the potter's vessel. It would be dashed, crushed, unrepairable. There would be no other chance for these pots to repent and be made new. This will be a great day of judgment. When we consider that this prophecy was fulfilled, we we can even think back historically to the time around AD 70 when the Jews were brutally persecuted and destroyed by Rome. However, as Scripture declares so clearly, there is yet another day of judgment coming, a final day of judgment when the children of man will be eternally sentenced, and that day will be dark indeed for many. It will be a day where many are crushed and sentenced eternally to hell. Scriptures declare that broad is the way to destruction and many are on it. Christian, let this remind you of your righteously deserved punishment for your sin. Let it remind you of what your Savior paid to ransom you from the wrath of God for your sin. Do this so that you never lose sight of the beauty of God's saving grace given to you in Christ and of the joy of having our sin paid in full by Jesus who was crushed on our behalf. You see, Christian, when we operate out of and and live out of this gospel-centered reality, we will be quick to warn of God's wrath and to preach of God's mercy and salvation through the gospel of Jesus. Remembering this reality will help us remain humble when we warn those dead in sin of the wrath of God to come. It will also remind us that we can indeed be angry and yet not allow that anger to draw us into sin. Since we were forgiven for our rebellion, let us be angry and not sin. Rather, let us turn our focus to warning the world around us of God's righteous decree and the gospel that saves. Psalm 2, verses 10 through 11. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Christians, let us declare this truth to those around us. Let us declare it to those over us and let us do it in a humbly loving way with a desire that God may perhaps save some and that we may be able to be a part of his saving work. Let us not do this in fear. Our God laughs at their rebellion. Rather, let us warn our rulers to be wise, warn our rulers to repent, to serve the Lord with fear and trembling for their rebellion And their striving to throw off God's rule will be in vain, as he has already set his son on the throne. Let us warn them, Christians, to, as Psalm 2.12 says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. You see, the same way we are thankful that the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus, For those of us whom he saved, let us strive to warn others so that they may also be saved if it is God's will to do so. I want to end our time together this morning by focusing on uh, the last words of this psalm and encouraging those of us who really are feeling the weight uh, of the things that are happening in the world around us right now. Psalm 2, verse 12, the last part of that verse says, Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Christian, if you lose your job and all that you've spent your life working for, do you know how blessed you are that God has made a way for you to take refuge in him? I do not intend to be flippant here. I do not mean that unjust mandates that may cost you your job and all you've worked for are easy to comprehend or come to terms with. I do not mean that you should have no frustration. 
It is right to be angry when there is injustice as God has defined injustice. But what I do mean is that we who are saved by the grace of God have a refuge in any storm that this sinful, fallen world may bring. This refuge was a regular refrain in many of the Psalms. Psalm 9, 7 through 10, But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice, and he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Psalm 46, 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. Psalm 9, 91, sorry, 1 through 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Psalm 57, 1 and 2. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for in you my soul takes refuge. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge till the storms of destruction pass by. I cry out to God Most High, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. Church, God has a plan and his will cannot be thwarted. He has promised good to those whom he has saved. That good is eternal life in Christ, and it can never be taken. No amount of raging, no amount of plotting can ever remove the security that you have, Christian, in Christ. Nothing can take that from you. When the turmoil of the world around you feels overbearing, Go to God as your refuge. Go to his word and be reminded of his faithfulness and his sovereignty. Thousands of years before it took place, he prophesied what the nations would do to Christ. And it took place. He has not failed. There's no false prophecy. There's no wrong words in scripture that that can be proven to be untrue. And so he has proven himself time and time again. Take heart. Trust in him. Trust in his word. Go to him in prayer and lay your worries at the feet of the only one who can change your circumstances. You may not know what tomorrow is going to bring, but God does. And you can trust him, for he is good. I know that many of you are dealing with many heavy things in your life. Uh, Being an elder means you get to have Uh, some insight to a lot of the goings-on of the people that you shepherd. So there are a lot, a lot of weighty things happening. There are threats to jobs and and great tensions in marriages and families. There's struggling children. There's loss. There's distance. There's hurt. And these can all seem very dark indeed. But God has given us the light of the world who is Christ Jesus. Let us ever be reminded that to live is Christ Jesus. And to die is gain. We must consider our days. We must be good stewards and strive to do what is right. But we must not be consumed with worry as if our God is not in control. I pray that this reminder is a sweet blessing to you as it has been to me. I want to close with reading Psalm 2 and Psalm 3 and then praying. Psalm 2, 1 through 12. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. 
You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Psalm 3, verses 1 through 8. O Lord, how many are my foes! Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God, Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered from his holy hill, Selah. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Selah. Oh, how clear are the words of Scripture, church. God is our salvation. He is our refuge, our ever-present help in time of need. If you're feeling distant, if you're struggling, feeling weighed down by the, the circumstances in your life, whatever they may be, go to Him in prayer. Go to His Word. See what He declares to be true. See how faithful He has been through the ages and take refuge in Him. To live is Christ and to die is gain. There is nothing this world can take from you because you have all you need in Christ. Bow with me and let's close in prayer. Father, as many uh, hearts in the room today are are, uh, weighed down by various forms of sin and the way they are playing out in their lives, um, we know, Lord, that we have an eternal hope that is secured for us. I pray that your Spirit would be reminding our souls regularly how much joy we may have in your promise to never leave us nor forsake us. How much joy we may have in the finished work of your Son on the cross on behalf of those who love him and who have been called according to your purpose. How much joy we may have, Lord, in knowing that you are sovereign and that you will most certainly bring to pass all your holy will. When we are tempted, Lord, to be in dread or anxious, would your Spirit remind us of your words to come to you in prayer, to not be anxious about anything, but to cast our cares and our burdens upon you and trust you, for you are good and you are in control. It is because of Christ that we can pray. Amen.